Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jim Thorson from the Noah Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Dr. Thorson earned his PhD in 2011 from the School of Aquatic and Fisheries Sciences at the University of Washington. And currently he's the program leader and sole member of the Habitat and Ecological Process Research Program at NOAA. Dr. Thorson's work focuses on theoretical and applied research related to climate impacts, stock assessment methods, spatial statistics, and life history theory. Notably, Dr. Thorson developed and oversees the vector autoaggressive spatiotemporal fast R package, which is applied globally to stock, ecosystem, habitat, and climate vulnerability assessments. And the, talk, uh, the title of his talk today is Eating on the Run, Fast and General Analysis of Consumption and Movement Using Stomach Contents, Tags, and Surveys. With that, please take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Noah. Um, I'm excited to be here uh, virtually, and I wish I could be there in person. I, I haven't visited Stony Brook in person for a couple of years, but I was there for um, the defense of Cecilia O'Leary, who is a student of Janet Nye's. And, um, you know, Cecilia, I was on her committee, and then she worked with me as a postdoc and now works at the Alaska Center. You know, similarly, I um, am working with Matt Siski as a postdoc, and um, it's been a pleasure to work with so many talented people coming out of Stony Brook, including, in addition, you know, Sam Ermey and Emily Markowitz and, and many others who are in Seattle now. So um, I'd love to maintain the connection. Um, I also, you know, thanks to Cameron Hodge, um, Yang Chen, Jocelyn Runbaum, and many other colleagues who, who are there um, or in the, the region. Um, so I'm excited to keep thinking about ways to collaborate. Uh, as, as mentioned, you know, this talk is um, sort of a combination of two different themes, sort of improvements in how to do stomach content analysis and improvements in how to do movement. And, you know, it's my honest belief that we're, you know, right at the kind of, you know, entry point to sort of spatially downscaled models that have realistic movement properties and can track predator and prey behavior, including consumptive interactions at a fine scale. You know, this has been a goal of ecology for, you know, since the inception. And, you know, we finally have computational tools to assimilate new sampling technologies. And I think it's an exciting time to think about this, you know, these types of themes. So, you know, I was brought up, you know, focused, you know, initially mainly on population dynamics. And here's, you know, my kind of thumbnail sketch of that training that, you know, a lot of people, you know, from the kind of Walters or Quinn schools, you know, do these age structured models and track cohorts, use it to build a stock recruit curve and use the, you know, very informative information about individual growth and the highly stochastic sort of stock recruit relationship to, you know, make short term forecasts and use that for fisheries management. You know, that is been around forever and, um, you know, has developed this whole industry of quantitative stock assessment where, you know, stock assessors are responsible to stakeholders and to the Fisheries Management Council and SSC to represent you know, a whole suite of information about their stock for use in fisheries management. And, you know, that role of a stock assessment is sort of an expert in population dynamics, but they're also a filter on what other ecosystem habitat information is relevant for fisheries management. And so a lot of this is about equipping stock assessment scientists with the ability to, you know, rapidly explore other concepts that people are proposing. You know, of course, there's also a long history of trophic ecology and, you know, the North Pacific, North West Atlantic and the ICES region all developed massive stomach content databases to parameterize trophic models, you know, and you end up with these sort of horrendograms like this one for the Eastern Bering Sea, you know, where there's this tremendous set of different, you know, carbon flows, um, which are obviously there from, you know, stomach content and other types of sampling. Uh, 
Um, but it's, you know, a whole other set of tools that have been developed, including, you know, e ecosystem, you know, ecopath with ecosim, you know, size structured models, Atlantis, you know, so it can be intimidating for somebody to try to be an expert in both of these. And then, you know, even more, I mean, again, since the genesis of ecology, but, you know, more recently, I'd say there's a bunch of, you know, high performance methods for getting at individual movement. So this is a snippet. This is sort of a diagram from um, Julie Nielsen, a paper of hers, explaining a hidden Markov model, um, like a forward filter and backwards smoother. You know, Julie calls this convolution. And for people who are not, you know, well-trained in signal processing, which I think most ecologists are not, you know, the term convolution can be intimidating. Um, and so again, this is sort of, you know, spatial and movement ecology is tremendously important in, you know, in ecological theory, but it's hard to be in, you know, it's hard for anybody to be an expert in, you know, each of these enough to see how to combine them. And so again, I'm, I'm, you know, my goal as a researcher is to figure out how to bridge these gaps and to, you know, find ways that we can develop models that, that, that explore trophic movement and population dynamics. So with that, I'll turn to the first of three sort of published papers exploring different concepts. The first is this paper that's in press at Ecology with Yumi Aramitsu at USGS, Tal Levy at OSU, and Gretchen Roffler at ADF&G, Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, the paper is, I think, online in Ecology. I'll, um, and um, there's an R package we'll discuss, MV Tweedy. And so um, in terms of food habits data, you know, historically people have done stomach content sampling with, you know, on deck capture and sorting. Um, you know, people used to shoot seabirds out of the air. You know, we don't do that anymore. Instead, there's these, these bill load samples where they put a cover over a nest, you know, a little, yeah, a nest. And then animals, when they return, drop the food out of their mouth when they find a their nest covered, um, you know, there's, there's, there's bycatch or, you know, dead animals that wash up. There's a variety of visual sampling of stomach contents. There's behavioral observations. And then there's a growing suite of biogeochemical markers, you know, fatty acids, stable isotopes. And each of these can be complemented by kind of new methods like, you know, internal temperature loggers, um, quantitative PCR metabarcoding genetic techniques. And so, um, there's this sort of flood of food habits data coming in and a need to figure out how we can kind of conveniently um, analyze them and put put power into a wider set of people's hands. So in terms of um, food habits, data analysis methods, you know, historically, I think one of the first was just the um, the average, the sample average of your of your data set of the percent frequency occurrence, the encounter rate, or the biomass um, reconstructed from hard parts or directly sampled. And, you know, this has the disadvantage that it conf confounds, um, you know, spatially unbalanced sampling with the response. You know, so if you prefer, you know, if you have a higher sampling rate in some area than other, you take a straight average, you're going to be biased towards the area where you have more data. There's, um, you know, the Alaska Center, and I'm sure other, you know, the Northeast Center, I'm sure does it too, you know, does uh, post stratified expansion of sampling. So, you know, takes the samples and expands them based on predator densities from a separate sampling design. Um, you know, this has a disadvantage that these sort of post stratified sampling methods ignore fine scale heterogeneity within a strata. And it's hard to bring in continuous pr predictors like, you know, within a given size class, you know, there might still be variation that's predictable based on size. Um, you know, then there's this set of Dirichlet models, like the the Ainsworth um, model, that you know specifies a, a a probability distribution for the data, and so you can end up, um, you know, with a regression model that includes predictors. But I would say most people are not experts in Dirichlet model, you know, regression models. And furthermore, it requires pre-transforming the data. You know, so if you've got a sample with zero of any prey, the zero is not admitted under a Dirichlet distribution. You have to pre-modify the data 
to get them away from these bounds to suit the model. And you know, it doesn't make sense to change your data just to suit the assumptions of your model. Um, and then finally, I'll be presenting today the idea of replacing this with a Tweedy generalized additive model. So it's a model-based technique that allows a mix of continuous and factor value predictors, no need to modify the data, and it's, you know, it's just a glim or a gam. So I think most ecologists have a training in glims and gams. Um, and it's, you know, conveniently, it's based on what I think are pretty um, strong foundations, both in ecological theory and in statistical properties. So I'll introduce here what's called a thinned and marked point process. So there's sort of a branch of statistical ecology that's trying to replace model, you know, most model, found most models, build most models on a point process. Um, a point process is where individual location of each individual being modeled is treated as a random variable. So this is sort of a intrinsically kind of movement based model. A Poisson process is where individuals are independent random, so that counts in a given area follow a Poisson distribution. A marked point process is where each individual that you're modeling continuously across space has a quantitative mark like a size or maybe a qualitative mark like the prey, the, the prey species or taxa. And then finally, a thin point process is one where only some of the individuals across space are captured or observed, either because of a functional response like the processor capture and, or their sensor due to your sampling. And so um, in this case, you know, if you have prey randomly distributed at fine scales and prey have a body size that's approximately gamma distributed, then consumption over a fixed area will follow a Tweedy distribution and then the proportions will follow what I'm calling a multivariate Tweedy. So in this case, looking at the top row here of what will be a panel plot, this is a single replicate of three different prey species um, shown as these circles in purple. Prey two is in kind of teal and prey three yellow. Each of them has sort of um, an area with highest density. Um, and then there's three different sampling areas in these red, green, and blue circles. And we'll be looking at sort of what we're interested in. You know, we're imagining a central place forager where the predator is sampling within the red, green, or blue areas. And we count the number of prey of each of these three types that fall within that circle. And so if we do that, and we do that hundreds of times, we get a a, you know, a, a sampling distribution for the density of each prey at each site. So site A, and then the, the vertical lines are the, the realization that I'm showing in the, in the plot. Um, and so let's see, yeah, so site A, there's no, um, there's no, no, none of prey one in the red circle um, in, in the realization. There's a couple green, and then um, it looks like there's a bunch of yellows. And so those are the vertical lines in that left hand of the second row. Um, if we do it a bunch of times and calculate the long-term proportion, the proportion in site A, it's 63% of prey two, 28% of prey three, and 10% of prey one. And so on, we can do that for each site, and we can see what the theoretical distribution of, of prey capture would be at each of those sites. Um, we can then convert those um, densities and the gamma response to a Tweedy distribution and look at the predicted distribution from that Tweedy. And so these are now, instead of a histogram, these are continuous, you know, that's a function we can compute it anywhere. And the circles are the, pro the predicted probability of a zero from a Tweedy distribution. And so the second and row, second and third row have the same, very similar proportions and very similar distributions. And so this is where we're replacing, um, you know, sort of a predator foraging variables with a theoretical distribution of the Tweedy. And then if we make further restrictions on the parameters of the Tweedy, we get a model that we can fit directly to data using a glim. And so that's what is shown here, the, the optimal fit. Um, and so from row two to row three, there's some differences due to um, the assumption that the Tweedy is making that its density is just at a single point rather than an area. 
and from row three to four, it's assumptions about similar parameters. Um, so anyway, the Tweety can can match this kind of foraging process that we built bottom up. Um, you know, why do we care? Well, we can fit this directly as a glim or gam, calculate proportions using a multivariate logit transformation, and then visualize those proportions using ggplot. And so in this in this case, we're fitting, we're replacing a Dirichlet regression with just a standard glim using packages off the shelf that I think people, you know, we, many ecologists will have some familiarity with. So um, as a first case study, we looked at um, bill loads for tufted puffins in Middleton Island. And our package has this as a, a, a data set for seven prey taxa. Um, and the, the formula in the GAM is shown at the second row here. Um, you know, and, and here I'm putting a spline on year. Um, and then you can predict the response in a data frame and plot it using ggplot. If you do this, I mean, this is slightly extended from what I just showed and in, in including um, a sea surface temperature effect for these eight species looking across decades of sampling at Middleton Island. We see that, you know, initially there was this sort of alternation between Pacific sand lance and prow fish from maybe 1980 to 2000. And then from 2000 onward, there's more of an alternation between Pacific herring and capelin where, um, let's see, so herring has a positive association with sea surface temperature. And so as things have warmed, there's been this, in the last 20 years, there's been an oscillation of higher herring in warm years, less herring in cold years when capelin are more represented. And then most recently back to herring. Um, you know, and then other species have these, these sort of idiosyncratic patterns too. So, um, Again, we've got this sort of um, multi-decadal prey switching that shows up in this GAM um, based on sampling. The second case study we used was, was wolves and scat samples where they process it using metabarcoding, um, eDNA metabarcoding. Um, and so in this case, we put in a GAM for latitude and longitude and then a spline um, for latitude and longitude by group where group is the prey. And again, we plot it use, you know, using ggplot. And in this case, we get these predation landscapes for different, you know, these 10 different prey taxa. Um, I thought this was a lot of fun to, you know, confirm that, um, you know, black-tailed deer and moose are a large part of, you know, wolf diet throughout Southeast Alaska. But in the kind of Northern area, there's a larger proportion of fish in seaward islands, there's a huge proportion of marine mammals in some of these. Um, and similarly, there's, you know, they're eating beavers and, and bears and so on. So, you know, it shows this sort of landscape level plasticity of a generalist predator, um, you know, wolves. So the, the conclusion here is that fitting food habits data can be as simple as a GAM. I've got this MV Tweety package that's publicly available on GitHub. And it defines a new class, an S3 class for MGCV or Glim TMB that automatically does the um, multivariate logit transformation of output and gives you standard errors. And you know, doing this, you can put in covariates in log densities, um, visualize them as marginal effect plots, and so on. So. Um, Thanks to Yumi, Tal, Gretchen, and, um, and and as well as other people who contributed to ideas of the paper, including Scott Hacks, who's collected the data set over many decades. Um, stepping backwards in time, but kind of forwards conceptually, um, colleagues and I did, you know, extended this to do predator expansion of the predicted stomach content. So again, imagine a world where you've got um, spatially unbalanced sampling of predators stomach contents, um, you don't want to take the straight average of them to generate an, you know, an estimate of total consumption. Instead, you want to weight a predicted you know, prey proportion at every location based on the density of predators there, and then sum across space. And that's what this paper by led by Arno Gruss and including Gemma Carroll at um, um, Environmental Defense Fund, Elizabeth Ng is still a student at UW, Kirsten Holzman, Karim Aiden, Stan Kutwicki at AFSC, 
um, and, 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 and other authors. So, um, and the paper is out in Fish and Fisheries. So um, in this case, I, I'm not aware of anybody having kind of gamed this out in a um, continuous space modeling context before, but it's essentially replacing sort of spatially stratified weighting of stomach contents with a continuous landscape of predator density and a continuous prediction of um, prey, you know, prey selection. Um, so in this case, you know, local consumption is the product of it's proportional to um, prey biomass per predator biomass from stomach contents and then predator biomass. I say proportional because there's ingestion rates that are missing um, and there's, you know, other catchability terms in the predator biomass data, but you get, you know, under assumptions about those, you can get useful total consumption time series across years. Um, so this model combines prey biomass per predator biomass, like, you know, stomach content sampling like the Northeast Center has with predator biomass sampling, which is routinely measured from resource surveys for stock assessment. Both of these are fitted as Delta models or can be, you know, the, the, the Tweedy model we talked about before can be approximated as a Poisson link Delta model that has the same moments. Um, and, and so you can do this joint SDM to combine the two in a single approach. So um, the first case study we did was Eastern Bering Sea large walleye pollock um, in the, yeah, the Bering Sea is shown here on the right um, from 1992 to 2015. And um, if we do this and, you know, fit a model to stomach content per prey, as well as the predator biomass, take their product locally, sum across space as an area weighted index, and then compute that as a proportion per year, which VAST can do internally. Um, we see that there's, you know, typically a large proportion of eufausids, but it varies over time. Um, you know, seemingly in some of the colder periods, there's a higher proportion of other things besides eufausids, at least in, in, in some of the times. Um, you know, I'm interested to see that amphipods are a larger proportion in the mid 20s, then fish have become an increasing proportion later. Um, in terms of the um, average stomach fullness, we can get an index of that as well. Um, and so stomach fullness was high at the beginning of the period and is, has sort of declined a bit over time. Um, we can get these landscape maps of consumption. So um, Eufaucid consumption is highest in this sort of um, southern middle domain. Fish consumption is relatively high in the north. And, you know, as Pollock has moved to the north over time, maybe that's why maybe we could attribute the increase in fish consumption to that northward movement. And then, um, you know, shrimps also being in the north, but also into Bristol Bay. Um, you know, we can kind of continue to compare these across years and look at interannual variation in the fish consumption by large pollock. Um, and then shifting gears to a data poor situation, we also did this for red grouper in the, um, let's see, I think it's the West, called the West Florida Shelf um, for only four years. And this is a data set that I, I'm pretty sure um, Cam Ainsworth helped us um, identify and access, um, you know, so that stomach contents and the catch rates, I think, are both from CMAP uh, bottom trawl. So um, looking again at kind of interannual variation and prey switching, we see that crabs are often a large portion for red grouper, but other prey were higher in 2012. Um, I guess that's as much as I know to say about red grouper. Um, the total stomach fullness has not changed as much over time, um, but the total biomass of red grouper seems to have gone down in the West Florida shelf over this time a bit. And so total consumption, I'm assuming, is also um, has also gone down. And then in terms of the landscape, I mean, red grouper um, has a distribution that's skewed towards this um, southern kind of near shore part of the West Florida Shelf, I think. And 
Um, so unsurprisingly, the consumption of all of the prey are highest where there's more predator density. But you can you can see that you know they seem to switch towards shrimps or the other prey category kind of more towards the north of their distribution, whereas they seem to be eating more crabs, for instance, um, relatively more crabs in the south. So, um, you know that you know moving beyond that MV Twiggy that glim, the glim can be useful for visualizing covariates and spatial patterns in prey switching, but you know, if for a lot of cases, we actually want to take that and then expand it based on predator biomass, sum it across space and get an index of total consumption. You know, we don't want to do that using a flat mean of the samples or of the predictions. Instead, we want to do a, um, a predator expansion of that. And once we do that, you know, that's a standard data input to a lot of population and ecosystem models, including Osmos. Um, yeah. So then finally, um, I'll switch over to, you know, a separate set of models related to um, habitat preferences. So um, this is work that I did with, um, that's published in Fish and Fisheries, working with um, Steve Barbeau, Dan Gothel, um, Ned Lehman, Matt, uh, Kevin Swicky and Grant Thompson are all at the Alaska Fishery Science Center with me. Kelly Kearney is at um, is affiliated with PMEL and UW. Um, Julie Nielsen is a contractor, and Matt Siski is a is a postdoc with me at UW. Um, and in this in this case, again, the goal was to think about how to combine different data types to get sort of a consensus picture of movement. In this case, for Pacific cod, but using methods that I, I think are much more broadly applicable. So um, again, you know, like so many things in fisheries, there's a, I'm sorry, these, it keeps advancing unless I um, click it back. So, um, you know, over, you know, since, as far as I know, going back to the 70s, and I'm sure earlier, um, there's been a huge deployment of conventional tags, you know, Floyd tags. Um, return rates are incredibly low. And so you, you typically do this for commercially important species where you can tag tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of fish and then um, make some incentive program for fisheries, you know, either at a terminal fishery or offshore to when they capture it to return it. Um, you know, there's also information about movement in survey data. You know, it's it re reveals the outcome of movement. Um, so it's an indirect measure of habitat preference. Similarly, fishery data is a broader seasonal pat, you know, time frame, but has a bunch of concerns related to catchability. You know, more recently, there's um, archival tags that record temperature and depth and light and can be used to reconstruct movement tracks. There's what I'm calling movement gates, so upward facing acoustics or weirs. There's selection experiments where people, you know, put captured fish in a box and see what it takes, to, you know, what what it prefers or how they can change the environment and change the um, preference. There's chemical and genetic and parasite markers um, that give various time scales of information about their past habitat utilization. And then finally, there's occurrence and density and predator food habit samples like I've already been talking about. So um, using predators as samplers, it makes a lot of sense for some forage fish and, and, and zooplankton that fish are still better samplers of them than our, you know, survey programs. So um, how do we think about movement in a, in a sufficiently general way, but not using a lot of brain cells to remember it? And for me, I, I find it very helpful to think about an instantaneous movement rate matrix M that I'll, I'll call it M prime. And so um, M is a matrix between different spatial locations, and it's uh, it's called a continuous time Markov chain. So if you have an M matrix that in this in in the rest of what I'll show, it'll end up being a hundred by hundred matrix. Um, but movement is only between adjacent boxes, and so you know fish can't teleport. Um, and so we've got this this sparse M matrix, M prime matrix that's let's say 100 by 100. And we model that as a combination of three different processes. So one is a diffusion rate matrix, 
um, that contains the probability of a cell, you know, a fish leaving a cell randomly. So that matrix is negative on the diagonal and positive on adjacent cells and zero everywhere else. There's a taxis matrix that's, that's um, movement towards preferred habitat. Again, that's sparse. And then there could be a passive advection rate matrix that could, you know, generated from tidal currents or dominant currents. It's sort of a vector field that's discretized again at these um, for these grid cells. And so if you if you if you decompose instantaneous movement into these three processes that are each interpretable and can be measured individually, um, you then need to convert it to a movement fraction over a given season or year. And to do that, you know, I just use this matrix exponential. So, um, you know, it's a, it's very analogous to exponentiating any, you know, scalar continuous rate. Um, and, you know, in practice, there's a bunch of fancy linear algebra behind the scenes, but you don't need to know it to use this in a computer. Um, it, you know, all software has a matrix exponential operator. Um, and so for a given, you know, if you have an instantaneous rate, and you want to calculate the outcome of movement over 90 days, you take that rate in movement per day, multiply it by 90, take the matrix exponential, and you get a movement fraction. The columns all sum to one, you know, it conserves abundance. And then you can take that as, a, as an operator and project a vector of abundance at your 100 cells to where they would be 90 days later by just like, in this case, left multiplying by this um, this exponentiated instantaneous rate. So, um, you know, not everybody's going to get this from thinking about it from two minutes, but my, my hope is that you can, you know, for people who um, do population models, we're all used to taking a rate and exponentiating it. Um, and this is essentially just a linear algebra version of that. And instead of like a fishing mortality rate, like a scalar, in this case, you've got this um, movement rate matrix um, that is has components due to diffusion, taxis, or passive advection. So um, the key to this is the taxis portion. And um, this is sort of the conceptual breakthrough I had that led me to pursue writing this paper to kind of describe it. Um, if you have a, a preference function H that's a property of each location, um, you can use that to calculate the taxis matrix as just the difference. So taxis from one place to another is just the difference in their preference. Um, and H, the preference function, you could have be like in any linear model, it's just a, a product of some covariate, some habitat variables and some coefficients alpha that you would want to estimate. So in the following, I'll look at bathymetry and bottom temperature, but it could be prey densities. Um, you know, it could be, you know, sea ice. Um, it could be any anything. Um, other, other people call this a potential function, and that's sort of, um, you know, an analogy to physics, like the flow of um, electricity or, or whatever. Um, but I, I prefer to call it a preference function because the function is a measure of, of habitat preference and we can measure that directly other ways. So um, if you take this as a, a 1D example, just to kind of walk through the math. Um, so here we've got um, 25 discretized locations along a single axis, the x-axis. And let's pretend we've got two environmental layers. One of them is bottom temperature that's higher in the west and the east. And then we've got depth that increases from the west to the east. And if, we've, if we just make up a habitat preference function, you know, 0.5 times temperature plus depth, we get a combined habitat preference in the top left that's that black um, discretized function. Um, we then plug in some a value for the diffusion matrix. And this in the um, panel B, I'm showing the 25 by 25 matrix of diffusion where every cell is um, adjacent to its neighbor in that ordering. And so, and then it's zero for non-adjacent cells. So it's white for zero um, in most of the cells and it's negative on the diagonal and positive on the off diagonal. 
um, indicating that diffusion is just the process of moving away from where you are in a given time. The Texas matrix, um, you know, the preference is lowest in the middle at about three. And so that's, you know, if you start out right at the lowest preference, you could move to the left or the west or the east. And that's essentially where the, the order switches in panel C. If you're um, further west than value three, um, you tend to want to move further west, which is above the diagonal. And if you are higher than three, you tend to move want to move east, which is below the diagonal in that panel C. And so then the, the bottom row is showing what happens if you start out in time t equals zero at a place in the west, in the middle, or in the east in that gray bar. And you know, after one time, it's just reading off a column of the exponentiated movement rate matrix, the movement fraction matrix is what I call that. And that um, time t equals one distribution is shown in red in each panel. Um, I'll, I'll maybe just to kind of walk this through, I'll talk about this panel. So you start out here. After one time, you've kind of started moving. Some move west, some move east. After time, th you know, three time intervals, they've kind of spread out more. Um, by ten intervals, they're here, and then by you know, as t goes to infinity, you converge on the stationary distribution which is the utilization distribution is what sometimes people call that. And the, the black line is the utilization distribution is the same everywhere. Um, you know, as time goes to infinity, the population is fully mixed. And so regardless of where an individual starts, they all end up with the same probability of being anywhere. Um, and so that's sort of a, a key link between movement ecology and population dynamics is that a movement rate matrix is associated with a stationary distribution, which is sort of what you'd sample. Um, on, you know, that's the average distribution given a, a set of movement rules. Um, so you can take this movement, the movement fraction matrix M that's exponentiated, and you can use it to project abundance forward. And then, um, you know, I'm interested in spatial, spatial ecology and spatial modeling. You know, so I have this epsilon of t. It's a vector of spatially correlated process errors um, representing unknown dynamics affecting abundance. Um, let's see, I'm missing a log here, aren't I? Um, and then, um, yeah, oh well, that's fine. Um, and then um, epsilon is this, yeah, this, this process error that's um, spatially correlated. Um, and then survey data might be Tweety distributed. Fishery data, if we have no zeros, might be gamma distributed. Um, if we have conventional tags, we can fit that as a categorical distribution. It's just the probability for a given release location and a given, you know, if we condition on the recapture, um, it's just a function of the time elapsed and the initial place and the final place it's seen. We can also bring in data about movement gates, you know, so by basically making these accumulator rows prior to exponentiating. Um, so anyway, so it's sort of a framework that can fit survey, fishery data, conventional tags, and movement gates, um, as well as other bi biogeochemical tracers. And um, we applied it to data from 35 years of Pacific cod in the Eastern Bering Sea. Um, it's sort of a toy demo. I mean, it's not, we're not, we presented at a CIE review for the um, stock assessment and it's not the way we're going forward because we think we need more research about the covariates that actually drive habitat preference. But um, in this case, we explored bathymetry and summer and bo winter bottom temperature from a ROMS mo a climate model. Um, we have summer and bottom summer bottom trawl survey data, summer and winter longline fishery CPUE and conventional tags, and then the longline fishery effort is used as a um, recapture probability for the tags. So um, these covariates, there's a compilation of bathymetry that's used for essential fish habitat. It's the same across all years. We're not accounting for like earthquakes and things that affect uh, bathymetry. Um, and then there's climate hindcast and forecast from this bearing 10k ROMS model that um, people have been developing, like for the, you know, that will be extended for the climate and fisheries initiative if that goes forward. Um, we're extracting the bottom five meter values for summer and winter. Um, and these are 
shown below. So um, we fit it as an R package ATM and the habitat preference function, we can use the effects package in R to generate these marginal effect plots. Um, so in this case, the habitat preference is a function of bottom temperature. They um, have decreasing habitat preference. You know, they, they avoid temperatures that are below zero degrees Celsius, sort of flat preference estimated from zero to four, and then maybe increasing a bit for warmer temperatures again. Um, and the intervals are, for the most part, overlapping, except for that avoidance of negative Celsius, which of course is not frozen because of salt and pressure. Um, in terms of bathymetry, we put in an interaction of um, a, a, a spline for bathymetry interacting with a season. And, you know, it seems like their winter bathymetry, you know, or it's estimated that their winter bathymetry is somewhat more flat than the summer. But again, both of them have really large intervals. So, you know, based on what we fitted, there's not a huge signal um, of their preference. And that's, um, yeah, that's part of why we, we need further work to use this operationally for Pacific Cod. Um, despite that, we can still do, you know, we take the fitted model and we can run experiments of what happens if we hypothetically had released an individual at the beginning of a cold stanza, cold sequence of years in the kind of southern middle domain or at the same place at the beginning of a warm sequence of years. And we forecast it forward of six months, like a single season from the top row to the, or yeah, six months in the top row, 12 months in the bottom, in the next row, 18 months. Um, or then longer periods of time. And so, you know, after, um, you know, five years, the distribution, the predicted distribution is still somewhat, um, well, it's different between the summer, the, the warm, the cold stands and the warm stands, it's slightly different. Where in the warm stands, they're more likely to have moved inshore and further north um, in the second right row, right column compared to the left column. Um, in terms of estimated population density, this is being reconstructed from movement, but also from the process error term. Um, we get these preference maps, in, which are the left two columns, and then a log density, numerical density in the summer, winter, and the next two columns. Um, so, you know, um, summer and winter, they're predicted to be kind of more in the Eastern Bering Sea. Um, by 2017 and 18, they are predicted to have these hot spots up in what the Northern Bering Sea that used to be this sort of ice covered ecosystem. Um, and so this model is capturing the northward shift. Um, and then habitat preferences are, are very different between years. So for instance, 2017 and 18, their preference is largely to have moved, you know, it's predicted to have been that they'd moved near shore, whereas in colder years, they avoid this cold pool and so they get kind of piled up more on the outer domain. Um, we can do diagnostics. You know, these are Dharma diagnostics or pit residuals. Um, and I won't say much about it, except that there's not, you know, there's a little bit of spatial correlation and residuals in the tag um, recapture data set, but it's not awful looking. Um, and then, you know, we can take these fine scale movement fractions and coarsen them to just look at the aggregate movement from the eastern Bering Sea to the north or from the northern Bering Sea back to the east. And, you know, in the past, there was very few cod in the northern Bering Sea because it was too cold. Um, and, you know, it used to be that the probability of any fish that found itself in the north would be like 50% to move back south. That's dropped over time in this model. And so that's how the model explains that a larger portion of cod have kind of ended up in the northern Bering Sea. There's sort of a tendency for them to move north. It's still not, you know, per capita, it's a low probability um, year to year. But they, once they go up there, they're less likely to come back. That's how the model explains this northward shift. Um, and so there's different kind of ways of measuring that northward shift that's predicted by the model. But all of them predict increasing proportion, a decreasing proportion in the eastern Bering Sea and an increasing proportion in the north. Um, we can do these sensitivity analyses to dropping data. So if we drop the fishery data, um, 
the fishery CPUE data, we get fairly similar, you know, this is this is compared with what we saw in the movement, the top left panel um, relative to what we saw earlier about their movement after five years. And that looks fairly similar to what we had even with the fishery data. Similarly, the proportion of the Eastern Bering Sea, the time series ends up looking similar without the fishery data. If we drop the survey data, the movement looks kind of similar, but the long-term habitat utilization is all messed up. The model doesn't understand that it shouldn't have fish in the north. And so the time series of the proportion of the eastern and northern Bering Sea needs the survey data to be estimated accurately. And then without the tagging data, the proportion of the eastern and northern Bering Sea looks sort of similar. I, I won't get into details. But the movement after six years is way underestimated without tagging data. So tagging data is necessary to get the rate of movement, the kind of degree of mixing. Um, but the overall story can be captured just from survey data. So, you know, that should be, you know, kind of intuitive to people that tags are necessary to get at the rate of movement. Um, but survey data is really helpful to kind of put fish, uh, you know, assign fish across space so that the overall picture of habitat utilization is right. Um, finally, we can take these, you know, take the two box movement and plug it into the uh, two box stock synthesis assessment model that was explored by the in the stock assessment in 20, I'm forgetting now 2019 or 20. Um, and so the model that two box model without any movement information fitted this gray curve, the proportion of the Eastern Bering Sea. And basically it thought that over time 20 to 30 percent was in the north which is not at all what we think you know and we have good surveys back in the 80s showing that it was probably you know two to five percent at most um if we put in the, the two box movement model it has a huge effect on the assessment and you get this curve up here this blue curve is what stocks says using that externally estimated two box movement um, the movement rate is not high enough, the predicted movement rate from this model is not high enough to capture the huge increase in survey data that's shown in recent years in the north. Um, so neither, neither of these models, I'd say, is good enough for management, and that's why um, we need further work if we're going to, um, for Pacific Cod, if we're going to operationalize this. But um, the point is that this um, continuous time Markov chain is a platform for combining, you know, point count data like surveys and fisheries with, um, you know, conventional tags, you know, um, MPAT, you know, um, archival tags, predators of samplers, genetics, and biogeochemical, you know, eco-geochemical tracers. Um, you know, this is implemented using um, template model builder and a package called ATM that's public. It's not, um, you know, there's a, a full example that runs, but it's not amazingly well documented. Um, but it does show the TMB code to implement this um, continuous time Markov chain. So, um, you know, in, in this third piece, uh, you know, I want to come back to my claim that we can fit all of these various data for a synthetic picture of movement, you know, conventional tags in the Pacific we have for a bunch of species. We're spending a lot of money on archival tags and they're showing that Pacific cod is moving from like the western Gulf of Alaska into the Bering Sea. We've got surveys, you know, and every, everywhere, you know, well-managed regions typically have one or more surveys and then fishery CPUE over a larger seasonal window. Um, we're investing money in these sort of acoustic tags with autonomous detectors, like so sail drones um, that go out and detect tagged crabs. Um, there's also increasingly a set of genetic techniques for parentage, movement gates, like upward facing acoustics, where you in the acoustic backscatter, you can count which way fish are moving. That's, you know, Sam Ermey, who is at um, Stony Brook previously, has done some of that with radar for birds. And there's there's fewer upward facing acoustics in the ocean than there are radars for birds, but it's um, definitely a, a growth area. Um, chemical tracers and predators of samplers. So all of these different interesting data sets are complementary, and you know it's my hope to collaborate with people in thinking about how to combine them in a movement model that includes habitat preference, so we can link all of these to climate forecasts.
So um, with that, a lot of people collected different component data sets listed here. And thanks again to my co-authors. Um, and I, um, because it was a little bit short notice, I actually realized I didn't put like a final slide sort of how to bring this all together. I'll thank, um, you know, some of the organizers here um, and happy to take any questions if, if, if um, people want to talk more about this overall vision of, um, you know, predator stomach contents movement and um, ecosystem dynamics, ethics. Thanks, that was great. I think there's a lot of interesting insights here and there's certainly a lot of data sets out there that are spatially and temporally explicit. And you know, I think uh, tools like these can really help people utilize those data sets, so those are great. Yeah, and I, 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 I can share my screen again if, as questions come, but this is my chance to remind myself that there are actually people on the other side here, so thanks. Um, I see a hand raised from Joseph, or do you want to call people? I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I think if you want to call people, that's cool. Uh, well, you're muted. I'll, yeah, why don't you just jump in, Joseph? Hi, James. Thanks. That was a, a really nice uh, presentation. So I'm most familiar with the Pollock survey that uh, Alaska Fisheries runs. And I know when COVID occurred, right, they had really limited effort in 2020. I don't think any diet sampling, and I'm not sure how much they got out in 2021. Um, and you just said the models that you've got are maybe not ready to predict. So can you just talk about how much having those hiccups in the time series is gonna affect you in terms of you know, ground truthing the model or verifying or, or just looking at the uncertainties? Yeah, thanks for asking. So um, I should have a pencil so I kind of write stuff down. Um, I, the 20, yeah, the Pollock survey, you know, we have a Pollock acoustic survey and I assume that's what you mean. Um, you know, in 2020, Alex de Robertes had been doing some prototypes, um, a, a sail drone acoustic surveys and um, you know, it's hard, you know, we've got a grant to do a diesel drone because the sail drones are too slow to keep up with the white boat. Um, but we're still, you know, the sail drone was still good for getting some data. We, you know, the stock assessment actually used, well, they, they presented, I forget if it was in the base case, but they used VAST, a spatial temporal model to stitch together the sail drone, the limited sail drone data from 2020 with the um, white boat acoustics and other years. And so that's, kind of the triage we did in that first year of COVID um, or whatever year of COVID that was, I don't know. But, um, and then, um, yeah, stomach contents. I mean, I think, you know, there's gonna be these, you know, trophic models that are always gonna need to fill in that missing consumption date. I mean, you know, process error models need to plug it in as data. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, having a model-based estimator to fill it in, I think is probably the best that they, some of those models will have. And so that's the kind of thing that that like MV Tweedy or other models could do. Um, and then, you know, a plug, you know, Stan Cutwicky and colleagues at ICES has this ICES Pisces working group called WK User. And we made a first document previously and then they're organizing another workshop workshop in Galway this year um, about unexpected survey reductions and um, you know I think it happens all the time is basically the story like there's a French vessel that broke down and messed up an ICs year um, I think the Northeast Center different years the survey gets further in the George's Bank you know and these are all the the things where I think a model based, estimator is really helpful. Um, there's some back and forth ongoing about how to validate model-based you know, processing of data inputs. <laughs> um, but in a case like COVID where you, you need it and you don't have it, it's an easy, easy win, in my opinion. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jim, you there? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, go, go oh, for yeah, it. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you for the wonderful talk and uh, really appreciate your effort here. And I, I, I see there are a lot of uh, utilities of the, those type of models that you have developed. And, uh, but I have a, a couple uh, I have a questions about it. Uh, possible uh, uh, stationarity 
that I think that's assumption that you made uh, when you use, uh, especially when you use a long-term data. You know this, uh, and also I was wondering whether you have considered, you know, if you use a very long time data, and you know, whether you have considered uh, possible adaptation of uh, uh, individual organisms, uh, they, they probably shift to the, you know, their uh, 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 their prey without any problem, you know. So, so whether you have considered those kind of uh, uh, adaptions, and also possible regime shift, and and how whether you can use as a model actually detect a, a possible regime shift or define regime shift. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, um, yeah, I mean, these are hard questions. I, you know, like there's no, I don't think there's some generic fix. You know, my research is to typically to think of, you know, I, I'm, I'm super interested in non stationarity and like we've done state space models for that. You know, there's sort of statistical methods, but you know, generally, I think, you know, I'd rather talk about non stationarity as a question of kind of a missing variable. And so, you know, either there's sort of missing process research to figure out the state dependence of that process that's non stationary with without it without the variable, um, you know, or or state space methods just kind of impute that missing variable via some random effect, you know. Um, and so, you know, like, I, I guess, on the one hand, you know, non-stationarity sometimes leads back to process research. Like we have a bunch of crabs that, you know, Cody is dealing with snow crab collapse, um, you know, and we're doing process research to figure out like, did they move north in the Bering the Chukchi? Did they move offshore? Did they have, you know, bitter crab syndrome? You know, each of those types of non-stationarity could be targeted with process research. Um, you know, and then on the other hand, you know, until you have process research, just state-based models, you know, and, you know, delay difference and um, delay embedding, like that kind of Sugihara <laughs> munch, you know, re reconstructing attractors, you know, like having a variety of statistical time series methods seems like the best short-term fix that I'm aware of, but. Yeah, yeah, it seemed to me that, uh, you know, because you already have so many variables involved and, um, and the model is really complicated, and I think if you added a one, you know, this kind of a try to try to try to identify those uh, non stationarity within the model probably is pretty hard. Yeah. And 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 also I was consider, you know, you have a different components there. You you worried about a potential uh, kind of a, a, a correlations among among those variables and and whether this uh, maybe overfit the model. Well, yeah, so I, I have a paper recently that I called the Grand Habitat Challenge. And um, in that, you know, it's a, a lot of looking at sort of the mechanisms that cause co correlations between your covariates. And, you know, besides sort of like variance inflation factors, the statistical thing, I think the big problem is that you, if you're doing attribution, like, you know, if you want to attribute um, habitat change to temperature versus light levels, you know, and then somebody dredges a port and causes a bunch of um, dirt that changes light levels, you know, to get the, quest, the answer right of that habitat impact, you need to understand not just their correlation, but the actual causal mechanisms. Um, you know, and the same happens in ecosystem studies where like, you know, Kalanis, however you say it, Finchinus or something, you know, that, <laughs> The Kalanis you guys have, we have different Kalanis, so I don't know how to say yeah. your Kalanis. That, um, you know, like, is that the driver of, you know, right whale going up into Newfoundland or is there some other mechanism, you know? And I don't know how to do process research with whales exactly, but, um, it, you know, I'm sure there's some way to do it. Um, in, in terms of, was... yeah, in terms of Pacific Cod, I mean, we really only just took bottom temperature and bathymetry, and those are the most boneheaded things. You know, we didn't use zooplankton or anything. Um, so, um, yeah, bummer. My kid my kid apparently is getting picked up from daycare. That's the off-screen note I'm getting. Um, yeah, let's see. So for Pacific Cod, you know, my, uh, Matt Siski is currently looking at whether if we bring in sea ice extent or we bring in eufausids, whether we either of those are more predictive than bottom temperature and bathymetry. And, and anybody who studies cod is like those bottom temperature and bathymetry are not themselves that interesting for. So 
you know, I'm still hoping if we just turn over a few more rocks on that one, we'll find the, the winner. I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think it's great. Uh, looking forward to talk to you Monday about how yeah. to do everything. So yeah, <laughs> me too. To yeah, yeah great. totally. Yeah. Thanks. Do you have any other questions from the audience? Well, that sounds good to me. I um, thanks again for um, your time, and I look forward to uh, you know one of these days getting out there to Stony Brook again to see people in person. Yeah, thanks for your time, especially doing this on really short notice. Yeah, sure. Yeah. See you, Jim. Well, yeah. See y'all later. Yeah. Thanks again. Right. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye.